like a second opinion. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get started here. I think we have a, a as large of a group as we're going to have for tonight. So. Um, Thank you all for coming out and braving the potential storm of what's out there and um, joining us for this second in our four-part summer open house series. Hashtag CFOX10. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, <laughs> so we're really excited about tonight because as many of you uh, know, we've got Beth Parker, who's the on-air reporter with Fox 5, and many of you watch her at, at night and have seen her, her story. So, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, good news effect, as we're calling it, since you're one of the few that get to tell all these great human interest stories and share a little bit of what's going on within DC on a regular basis and uncovering all these cool stories, like the little library story mm -hmm. that you've got running tonight, free the little free yeah. library story. Um, but before we do, let me just remind people, this is the second of four, so we have two more coming up. We've got um, Summer Mathis from The Atlantic joining us in a couple weeks, and then uh, in August we'll have someone from USA Today, who's a breaking news reporter, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, covering essentially uh, breaking news and um, crisis reporting. We are talking um, earlier today about covering 9-11, and um, she's going to talk a little bit about um, the trauma that um, it, it uh, the, the toll it takes essentially on reporters when they're covering tough stories like that. Um, but we're on a much happier topic tonight. Yeah, that's why I do happy stories. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so we have people tweeting tonight, and so I'm supposed to remind you what are we uh, just I guess CFOX, CFOXCOM and hashtag CFOX10. We've got stuff going on if you want to track it. Um, okay, so first let me tell you a little bit about Beth if you don't know her, and I suspect that many of you do because this was the uh, this was the event that people wanted to come to to see oh, you. Good. I'm hear from you. Um, so uh, Beth has been with Fox 5 as an on-air reporter since 1998, mm -hmm. um, has won several Edward, Edward R. Murrow Awards and mm -hmm. eight Emmy Awards, I believe, for investigative reporting and feature reporting and all kinds of great um, great stories that you've covered. Um, and um, you've not just been in this market, although it sounds like this is the market that you've always wanted to be in. You've been in Baltimore and Virginia and North Carolina, and um, so I know uh, we're very happy that you're in this market and happy to have you here tonight. Um, Beth is also on Twitter at Beth Parker Fox 5. Yep. And um, so you know we're going to be, you and I, people can't really hear us using this. This is really just for Don's purposes over here. Oh, okay. Um, but we're going to just make sure that we are talking into this. I wondered, I thought it seemed like it wasn't. I know, it's a little strange. It's a little strange. I just wanted to play the part here. Um, so, all right, so here's the deal. We're doing this as best as we can here in a little bit of a TED style. So we've got um, a timer that's going to keep us going here. Uh, Mr. Fox back there is keeping our time, and we're going to see what we can do in 10 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions after that. But you and I have 10 minutes. Okay. Okay, let's go. Um, all right, so a lot of us watch you on the local news, and we see that you, um, night after night, get to tell these great stories of what's going on in D.C., and you tell them from really interesting perspectives. Um, so I want you to tell me a little bit about what's your definition of a good story, knowing that there's a lot of people after you every day to say, cover this and cover that, and you've got to make a decision on what really rises to the top. So tell us a little bit about what's the definition of a good story in your mind. Well, the number one uh, component, do you want me to hold that? That's fine. <laughs> Um, the the number one component of a good story for me is uh, that it has to be personal. It has to be impactful in some way. So uh, we're always looking for a way to really tell somebody's story within a story. So um, I was just uh, talking with someone the other day who was pitching a story about a playground that's uh, handicapped accessible and. Uh, they were trying to get money for this playground. And I kept saying, I got to have a family. I got to have a kid. I got to have somebody who uses this playground that you're trying to expand or fix up. Um, because you, to me, you have to sort of build the story around, um, around an individual because I think it's what makes people, uh, it's what's compelling. Uh, and then the other thing for me is having great sound and great video. Um, so if you're trying to pitch stories, you always want to be thinking, you know, what does this sound like? What's this going to look like? Uh, because I think that those are the things that kind of transport people, you know, when and they hear all that natural sound at a story or you know the guy with the chainsaw or something splashing in the water it kind of transports people to where uh, where it's happening and so to me that's uh, that's good storytelling just making people feel like they're there yeah cool 
Cool. So this series, is, as you know, is about pushing the envelope in storytelling. So finding people who are doing new and interesting ways in how to tell a story, both, both in their technique, but also in the tools that they're using. So um, I got to see you in action a few weeks ago telling a story about a new uh, campaign in Montgomery County uh, on disability etiquette and awareness on physical disabilities. And you took this really interesting approach of saying, I want to tell this story from the perspective of someone who um, is living with a physical disability. So it's one thing to say there's a campaign out there, and that's a good thing. But I'm going to attach a GoPro to a wheelchair and walk around Rockville Town Center and see truly what it's like from his eyes. So um, we know you're using GoPros more often. You're using um, maybe iPhones in a different way. So tell us about how technology is changing how you tell a story. So it's a good thing that my bosses aren't here because they know me as like the GoPro stalker. <laughs> when we didn't have GoPros, I was always like, hey, when are we getting those GoPros? And it went on for like two years. They're not that expensive, actually, but uh, don't tell my bosses I said that. But, um, but um, you know, the GoPros go into places that uh, we can't take this huge camera that weighs 40 pounds, which is the camera we need because it looks great on TV. Um, but I did a story the other day on a bus driver who'd been driving bus for like, 60 years and you know we were able to take the GoPro and stick it right under the gas pedal you know and you get this shot looking up at the guy and you know that's something we could never do and it's the same kind of thing I was talking about a second ago just this idea of taking people right to the place um, so we use the GoPros a lot um, and there's a lot of other technology that people don't think about that I think make my stories a lot better uh, than they were in the past because uh, it's sort of time-saving technology. So our cameras now, uh, not the GoPros, but the big cameras, have a little SD card in them, just like what you use uh, you know, in your camera at home, in your still camera. And so uh, when I'm in Leesburg doing a story, I can sit in the car pop that into my laptop and I have my whole story logged and I know exactly what sound bites I'm using and what video I'm using so that by the time I get back it gives me extra time to tweak the story and really make it more compelling in the writing and then it gives the photographer and the editor a lot of extra time to to put it together so it uh, takes a little of the pressure off the deadline yeah. crunch yeah cool all right so on that topic on the topic of, of efficiency um, there was a Pew report that came in not too long ago about local TV news and how back, I guess it was about 10 years ago, 31% of stories, of local TV news stories, were 31% of them were over a minute long. Now it's 20% 20, 20 of stories are over a minute long. So significant decrease in the length of the story. And yet you still have to get the same story out there. You still have to get the message out there, but in less time. So how have you battled that, telling a great story with fewer seconds? So, well, I actually am probably the exception to the rule on that because I happen to work at a place where they will give us extra time. Um, so my stories are a lot longer than, um, uh, like, if one of my competitors does the exact same story, I'll probably have 30 seconds more, which in wow. TV is a lifetime, yeah. So most of my stories are about two minutes long or if I'm pushing my luck, like 210. Wow. Um, but um, there's a station in town, I won't say which one, that has a rule, no, uh, no stories longer than a minute 20, and there's one uh, that uh, is no stories longer than a minute 30. Mm -hmm. And they actually will float the story, as we call it, they'll drop it down in the show, to cut eight seconds out of the story. So, and, and you don't want to miss slots. So that's a big deal if they're willing to not air the story. So they feel really strongly. Uh, and I think a, l a, lot of, um, a lot of that has been sort of uh, a response to the way viewers are reacting, that they want everything sort of quickly. And, but that was happening before Twitter and before a lot of the social media changes. So um, I have been fortunate that I have bosses who will, if I go to them and say, hey, this is really good, and I make my case, this is why I need an extra 20 seconds or 30 seconds, uh, they will most likely give it to me unless it's a huge news day. So what do they have to cut to give you that 20 seconds? Like what else has to tighten? Uh, well, I shouldn't tell you my. <laughs> I always go up to them because I think there's a TV news joke about uh, the water skiing squirrel, the sort of this joke. So I always say, don't you have a water skiing squirrel you could kill out of the show? Um, but, uh, you know, typically um, they're cutting either a VO, which is a little 15 or 20 second uh, voiceover um, on something completely unrelated, or I think the producers most of the time have an idea uh, going into a show, 
eh, this is what I could take or leave. Mm -hmm. And so they know going in, because sometimes someone will just talk longer or they'll be breaking news or a live shot that runs long. So they have a sense of what they can kill. Yeah. And um, But they also have to hit meters. Uh, they have to, uh, because of ratings, they have to hit certain uh, breaks at certain times during the show. Mm -hmm. So uh, so they have to be careful, too, about not letting a reporter go too long, because they have to answer yeah. to uh, their bosses about that. Yeah, yeah, cool. All right, well, thanks. I threw up a purple. No, that's OK. Um, all right, so um, you mentioned Twitter. So we're going to talk about social for a second. So um, what is Fox 5's stance on breaking news on social, on, on Twitter or any other platform, versus waiting until that evening news broadcast to break the news? It, it feels as if people go first to social to see what the breaking news is. And so you can't always wait until the evening news to break that story. So um, what's the station stance on that? How do you manage it? Breaking news. Do you wait? Do you do it on social? Um, it kind of depends on what it is. Um, there are a lot of things. If I have an exclusive story that I know no one else has, uh, or I'm confident that no one else has, we'll wait, uh, depending on what it is. But a lot of times we'll wait, and then I would normally be tweeting during the day about what my story is, mm -hmm. but I would tweet it at like 5 of 5 mm -hmm. so that no one else can confirm it, so they don't have enough time. Nice. So we do that. Um, but if, especially if things happen much earlier in the day and it's a big, impactful kind of story, a lot of times we do break stories on the web now. Yeah. Um, and I think there is kind of a push, and we're constantly under deadline and trying to find creative ways to still make the news when it airs compelling. So, you know, you can't say anymore, hey, uh, here's this really cool video, because everyone's seen it. And if you run that tease at 8 o'clock at night and say, coming up at 10, anybody who's sitting on their sofa is going to just pop on their phone and... Right. There's that video. Yeah, so you have to say, what's the meaning of that? Or uh, find some way to advance it or to make it compelling to give someone a reason to watch at yeah. 10 o'clock. Okay, cool. All right, two minutes left. So let's see if I can get two questions see, in. I know. <laughs> All right, so, um, so what's next? If we're talking about the future of storytelling and pushing the envelope, what are you excited about? Uh, what's happening in the newsroom? What's happening in local news? What's happening in journalism? Where you see things evolving that excites you? Um, well, I think a lot of people are, you know, a lot of people who've been around news for a long time tend to think, oh, you know, social media and Twitter and uh, maybe have some negative views of it if they've been around for a while. I actually think it's a really cool way to spread your stories um, uh, around. Like when we do, I try to do a lot of positive stories now because I was tired of doing sad stories. And so, um, you know, my stories, uh, if they catch on on social media, uh, it has a, a huge audience, you know, and you can sort of advance stories and move them around in a way that you couldn't before. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find that that's exciting. And I think a good story is just a good story. And so it still travels. Um, you just have to find kind of compelling ways to, to tell them. Yeah. Okay. So, last question. What's, um, what's the one story that you've covered, if you can think of one, that still sticks with you as having had such an impact on you? Um, one of the, just one of the great stories that you were so proud and excited to tell in your career. Well, I have a really recent one that I really loved, which is um, a story about a guy that we did at the end of May, and he is a blind runner, and he runs in the Special Olympics. And uh, I had gotten an email in the winter from his coach um, who said, hey, you know, I've got this guy, and he's a blind runner. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, I watch your news. I wonder if you want to do a story. And I'm like, a blind runner? That's fascinating. So uh, it turns out that um, he runs in his lane and his coach runs next to him and tells him uh you know left left right right and go straight and uh so he's like 55 years old and just started running 10 years ago and uh, he was this incredibly compelling positive force like the second we got out of the car at this track where he was going to run for us i was blown away by this guy um, and it had people were really touched by him and by his story and how you know everything that he's overcome and then also um, it really impacted viewers so we had viewers calling us saying hey I want to buy that guy running shoes before the state special Olympics and um, so we did a follow-up story with a lady who worked downtown and met her at City Sports and uh, they actually uh, she bought some shoes for him had never met him and then while we were standing there I said, you know, so what made you do this? And she said, well, I had cancer years ago, and I was always a runner, and I stopped running. And then I saw this guy, and it made me go running. 
And so that's the kind of thing where, you know, I mean, that's, you obviously, she was touched by it. And so, um, so those are the cool stories that right. have an impact. Yeah. That's awesome. All right, I've run out of my time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so now I'll turn it over to all of you and see what additional questions you have. Hi. Um, hi. Um, I'm Beth Lee. I work with Carrie here at Fox. Um, thanks for being here. Sure. A question for you. Um, a lot of time. I was talking about this with the, some of our attendees tonight. You know, a lot of times some of the clients that we work with have really heart-wrenching stories. Oh. And, you know, we're talking about good stories here, but can you talk a little bit about striking the balance between, um, you know, a, in foster care or other other issues that are really you know there are some really bad things that happen to these kids mm -hmm. how do we um, I, I would like to think that everyone would be interested in telling the good story but I think that there's a, a degree of you know conflict makes a good story so what we find is we don't want to dwell on the negative and we want to give people hope um, can you talk a little bit about how we might strike the balance in, in enticing a reporter to cover a story like that while trying to get them to focus on the positive? Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Um, well, I think a lot of it is about the timing. So if it's a foster care issue, you know, it's great to do a story or pitch a story like that when there's something happening on the Hill or some new law. Um, but I also find a lot of times when stories on the surface seem really sad a lot of times there's something hopeful about them if it's like a, sort of a character in the story or something that someone's doing to help somebody else so a lot of times i find that that's a great way to get my bosses to bite on a story uh, is if they feel like there's uh, kind of a twist there that has sort of a feel good uh, and i know there's a lot of negative stuff on the news but the response that i get to positive stories is dramatically uh, greater and I tell my bosses that all the time I haven't totally convinced them but I'm working on it so uh, and that's a really important point to make that someone can pitch you a great story but you have to go pitch the story yes Yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah, and I do that all the time. Um, I really try to set up a lot of stories. So while I'm out doing one story on deadline, I'm always emailing people and calling and, uh, you know, and sending things to my bosses saying, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Um, to try to um, kind of get a little bit of a day ahead if I can. And there are days where I just have to do whatever the news of the day is, or I'm at a trial, or I'm at a murder. But uh, a lot of days I try to set things up just because I think people are kind of craving positive news. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Hi. Hi, I'm Ollie. I'm a journalist. I'm the news Twitter stalker. Um, <laughs> oh, right. You tweeted me earlier today. <laughs> yeah. You seem harmless. I am. Yeah. I am, mostly. Um, mostly. So I, one thing that I was um, wondering is how do you go about finding some of these great stories that you find, that you do find, something like the, the, the little libraries or the, the kid with the, the crayons? Those aren't things that you're I mean, seeing in the news that are like, cropping up on hill dockets mm -hmm. all the time so kind of what do you what do you do to kind of get out there and talk to people and find out what is going on uh, you know, a lot of it is things that I observe, actually. Um, so this little library story that we did today, there were two of them right near Channel 5 that have been there for several months. And uh, I was out riding a bike with my son in my neighborhood, and I noticed that three of them had popped up in my neighborhood and then last week there were two more and I was like what's going on with these little tiny libraries and you know what this is it's like a little box in someone's yard yeah. kind of looks like a birdhouse sort of yeah. uh, and so you can take a book or and leave a book uh, and it's just a free little library so um, so that's sometimes just observing things I also find that um, once you do a lot of these kinds of stories people will write to me directly and say, well, here's the deal. But, but I think I told you, Carrie, the story about how when we did the Blind Runner story, I got an email after the fact from um, the Special Olympics saying, hey, where'd you get that story idea? You know, And so I think it's an example of, and it's obviously a fabulous organization, but there are um, things happening kind of right under your nose sometimes that don't always get pitched. And so, uh, so it's kind of a combination of things. The crayon story, that was from a press release. <coughs> 
um, the foundation that gave, we did a story about a young man who grew up here in D.C. who has started this program collecting crayons that would normally be thrown out at restaurants. Uh, so, because the waiters and waitresses have been told they have to throw away all these crayons. So he collects them and gives them to shelters and he has them all over the world now. Um, some in refugee camps in Syria and he won a big award uh, a couple of weeks ago. And so I just pitched it as, hey, here's a local kid and uh, he won a $36,000 award. Um, well, the mayor still does regular press conferences and your boss, the mayor. Um, <laughs> Um, and I think that, so I think that those are really valuable to people who work those beats um, because even if there's not necessarily a, a story that comes out of it, it's sort of background information and I think it educates them every week about uh, what's happening or it might plant the seed for a story down the road or that kind of thing. I feel like it's most effective if someone covers the beat all the time. So like at the Department of Health, um, I don't know that you guys have the same reporters covering you all the time or maybe you do. Okay, so like medical marijuana is he, okay. Yep, yep. So I just I'm always curious because you know we put a lot of energy into making sure press conferences are great and backdrops are good and I try to add that human interest. But you know, just is there value you know out of that event? <laughs> yeah, I think that um, especially for TV, I think there's more value for print maybe, and even for radio, but for people looking for visuals, we perceive that as a really boring setting. <laughs> yeah, so we call it Bopsa. Bunch of people sitting around. <laughs> so yeah, we're like, eh, we can't go to that. Sure, specifically, like that. I tend to think you're gonna cover a story if you're not seeing it other places, right? Like Yes, and that's more of something that comes from our management. They want us to be the only people with the story, mm -hmm. um, or the first people. Right. It's okay if everybody else does it the next day. Right, right. <laughs> but you're not going to take a story if you've seen it on ABC the night before. So no. you should be thinking about that, too, yeah. just making sure that yeah. the story is somewhat special to you. It's fresh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Any others? Yes? Hi. Hi. My name is Nancy Wood, and I'm with Girl Scouts. Hi. And my biggest barrier pitching stories to the media is the litmus test of, is this news? And, you know, there may not be news, there's just, it's a good, feel-good story. Those little boxes that you, that you did, you know, libraries. Oh, right. Girl Scouts do those all the time for bronze awards. Is in that right? Neighborhoods. Yeah. So, I mean, and when I pitch that, no one's interested. There's no news value to it. Yeah. So, is it just finding the right Some of it's reporter? timing. Some of it's finding the right reporter, and then some of it's timing, I think. Uh, and... You know, it's, I'll tell you when we are just hurting, uh, is on holiday weeks. Like last week, leading up to the 4th of July, it was like the 2nd and it's the 3rd and everybody's out of town. If I'm you, I would jump on those weeks, you know, and I would say, hey, I know it might be a little slow over there this week. Or like, uh, you know, like the week between Christmas and New Year's and people are just looking for stories so no more vacations for me okay. yeah yeah no thanksgiving dinner for you <laughs> but you could get it all set up ahead of time you know and uh so just a thought okay yeah sure for me i i have to be right of course so um, whether I'm on like a breaking news story or so I don't tweet something unless I know it's right. Um, I think there are people maybe in different situations where there's pressure um, that pushes them more to, uh, to get things out there on social media and break stories that way. Um, so I mean I think it's an issue and it's definitely something that people in newsrooms are watching closely and try to make sure that, they're, uh, that it's reined in. Um, but it's a balancing act to try to sort of please everybody and win. But, uh, you know, it's better to be right than first, we always say, so. Mm -hmm. Great, well thank you. Sure. We'll, we'll wrap it up there, but thank <clears> you for being a good sport and letting us ask oh, you. Oh, of course. Unexpected That's all right. questions there. You know, I, uh, yeah. I've, um, gotten the chance to really get to know Beth over the last few months and I think every chance I have to sit down with you I um, I not only learn something new but I just appreciate you more I mean, you've got oh, this great you. sense of um, wanting to tell these great stories and wanting to elevate these stories and you have such a good sense of humor in the process too so thank you you're um, you're really a gem for 
for Fox to have. Oh, I appreciate that. So thank, thank you. you. Happy to be here. Thanks for Thanks. having me. All right. I think we um, have a lot of food <coughs> in the conference room, so <laughs> <laughs> head that way, or you can uh, yeah, or you can go to my office, which is the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to the series.